Hello everyone and welcome back to the Small Print Podcast with your host Elise and I blog at roulettereader.wordpress.com. I'm Dawn and I blog at bangbangbookblog.com. And we are going to bring you a review of Flame in the Mist by Renee Adia. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing her last name. Neither of us really know how to correctly pronounce it, but I believe that's what it is. Um, so Dawn, take it away with the synopsis. So synopsis on the fly. Flame in the Mist is about Mariko, and she is about to be um, married off to the Emperor's son, and she does not want this, but she's decided to just go ahead and do it anyway. It's not like she had a choice, but she she's going on to marry him, and her convoy is uh, set on fire, and she's the only one who survives, and so she has decided to find out who has tried to kill her and why. Bam. That's pretty much... Yeah. Um, as per usual, like if you wa- if you listen to our podcast, you know that we kind of talk about our likes and dislikes, and then we move into a spoiler edition. So we will continue with that structure today. I think we do dislikes first because we try to end on a higher. Note. Well, we do whatever's less first. Do we? Yes, we do. I don't think so. Well, I have very little likes. It's okay. So, all right, we'll do likes first. Let's just do likes first. It's faster. Okay. It'll it'll just. Right. Should we say our rating first, or should we wait? Uh, no, we'll wait. We'll wait. Okay. Yeah, let's wait to do the rating. All right. Okay. Well, likes. likes. Um, my first like was the setting. I did enjoy the sort of um, inspiration off of feudal Japan. I thought that that was very interesting. It's 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 very it's a very trendy setting. Um, so that was definitely something that initially drew me to this book. Yeah. I read War Cross right before I read this book, and it was also set in Japan. So I was like, oh, mm-hmm. I don't think I've read a book set in Japan in the last five years. And mm-hmm. I read two back to back. My next was the, let's see, um, going off of that, some, some of the Japanese mythological elements that um, Renee decides to put in her book, like uh, trees that, you know, if you get too close or if you touch them, they pull you in and start slowly draining your blood. They're kind of vampiric. Um, some, like, night beasts that live in the forest. I, I enjoyed reading about those elements of Japanese mythology that she peppers into her story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll um, second year two. And mm-hmm. then the one thing I'll add is she writes the POV of adults, and not a lot of people do that in YA, and I kind of like that. Um, they don't take over the majority of the story, but you do get a POV of a father mm-hmm. or a mother or something. So yeah, that was different. that was actually my next um, my next specific like is the storyline of the emperor and his wives. Um, there are a couple adult characters that we kind of have to know some more information about for the story to progress. And him and his wives kind of feature in that. And I found their stories and background, the little that we see of it, very compelling and very interesting. Um, so yeah, that was a like of mine. Yeah. And that's it. That's all I have. Okay, great. All right. So. Dislikes. Dislikes. <laughs> I'm just going to start us with the biggest one, uh, the main character. All right. I said her um, inconsistencies as a character. Um, specifically, she defines herself in her own internal monologue um, a, in a way that is almost always diametrically opposed to how she acts, and that really got old after a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I know authors do that to set up growth. <laughs> and I love the long We're pause. We're all sitting here like, but that doesn't happen. Yeah, her growth is weird in this book. I feel like she kind of grows kind of quickly, but then she doesn't, and she does yes. a little bit, and then she doesn't. Yeah, there's then... kind of some forward-backward action Yeah, uh, that happens with her growth. We'll go into that a little bit more in the spoiler edition, I feel like, but she, you know, the whole premise of this book that we start off with is that she's been attacked. Um, some people that she's had in her life for a really long time have been killed, and she is determined uh, to find out why and who did this to her. She has an idea, so she goes off of that, but, you know, so, so she, she ends up successfully, is this, is this, is that a spoiler? It might be. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's not, because it's in the Goodreads, 
it's okay. in the Goodreads description that she infiltrates their clan. Okay. The Black Clan is what they're called. Um, and apparently they live around this forest, and so they have this really serious, like, air of mystery and just negativity surrounding them. Like, you don't want to encounter them in the woods or anywhere, really. Um, and she re she bangs the reader over the head with the fact that Mariko hates these guys, has thought about killing them 50 times a day, and yet we never see her take any forward action to make this happen. And... You know, when you're 65% of the novel, you're 65% through with the novel, you're kind of like, where is this going? Mm -hmm. And that became a serious issue for me. Um, going off of that, um, so Adia, I read The Wrath of the Dawn. I only read book one. I didn't read book two. I didn't really care for book one, so I, I didn't finish the series. But Adia has a specific writing style, and she likes to write third person alternating POV and I don't think this works for her writing style because her characters are always in their head mm -hmm. and the only way to differentiate between the text and what they're thinking is italicized words that gets frustrating after a while and it also if the main character is not particularly compelling or interesting then they're boring and I don't care what's going on in their head so you kind of have to make that person an interesting person and a way to alleviate that is to write it first person so that alleviates all the italicized words because if you're telling me how you feel I don't have to read it like italicized separate from the text and you can I don't know it's just the, the main character can tell me why they're behaving the way they're behaving. Mm -hmm. it, I just feel like a first person off any POV would serve her better than third person. Yeah, I read a review on Goodreads about her writing style that I found very, very true. It's that, you know, she she has a flair for the dramatic. She, she, she tends to hype up her own writing so that in a way that you, you sense as a reader that, okay, I should probably be paying attention to this particular bit of information right here. And so you kind of log it away in your head as the reader, and then when nothing ever comes of it, because it wasn't actually meant to be anything that you should pay attention to, you kind of get this feeling of, like, disappointment or, again, confusion about what actually is the meat of the plot and, and the character that we're reading about. And it just becomes difficult it just was really difficult to read I hated it that's more into the writing style yes let's go back to Mariko okay I'm gonna butcher these people's names so I'm just letting you know right now <laughs> apologies um, in advance yeah um I don't know if this is writing style or if this is Mariko well it's kind of both mm -hmm. so um I have I don't know how many books I've read this year of this type of writing style where it's the main character, it's usually a woman who's being forced to do something by somebody and they don't want to do it. I don't want to be patrolled. I don't want to be told what to do. Oh my God, I'm so sick of this plot device. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do this, you need to add something new. Mm -hmm. And I feel like she did do a masquerading as a boy. It's a little bit different than what I read, but she hasn't really added anything new to this overused plot mm -hmm. device at all. So yeah, I agree. Um, she, this whole she doesn't want to do what she is being told to do is not compelling. And I'm trying to segue this into my next point. <laughs> but I don't like reading about Mary Sue characters either. And I feel like that's what she is. She's this, this character who is being vaunted as this like intelligent, smart person who's not really able to tap into their own smarts or intelligence because of their gender or whatever um but then you gotta back that up in the story with her intelligence and again that doesn't happen she does get credit for developing some things that really end up helping the people whose side she's on and i won't go into details but that's really it and i i found that implausible yeah, because she's supposed to be this wayward boy. Yeah. And if you don't want people to, like, start trying to figure out who you are, don't show them that you're intelligent. Yeah, why would she give these people that she just met um, technology that could honestly revolutionize warfare where she lives? Like, 
this is I, a yeah, big deal. No, and the author never goes into that. Well, like, she says she's trying to get them to trust her, so she's going to show them how to make weaponry, but at the same time, they're going to use it against you. If you're Especially so smart. If you think that yeah. they killed you. They if, tried to kill you. Like, no. I don't. If you're so smart, you can de- you can develop something that isn't as great as your greatest invention and give it to them. I mean, you don't need to turn over your entire secret or life work to these people. It was just so obnoxious. And we're just supposed to be like, oh, yeah, I guess she developed this, you know. Bomb. Yeah, bomb and the throwing star. It's like, come on. <laughs> but she can't. She's she's smart enough to develop that kind of technology, but she can't exact revenge on on her family. Like what? Oh my god! No, 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 no. I don't have anything else about her. About her, I don't either. No. Um, I mean, she does things that. I don't understand why she makes those decisions, but I feel like that's more of a writing style. Yeah, I just, I wrote down faulty logic. Just constant faulty logic. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if this is a character... Well, okay. So, on the lines of faulty logic, I... Uh, it's a spoiler. Never mind. Yeah. The ending pissed me off. I was trucking along, and then... Me too. I don't know if you do this, but when I read books, I can figure out... I call it the turn. I can figure out at some point in the book, this is the pivotal moment. It could be in the first third. It could be the last 50 pages. And this moment is going to make or break this book. And this mm-hmm. was the moment and it broke it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no. Yep. So that's a spoiler. I'll save it. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We'll save that for the uh, yeah. spoiler edition. Um, let's see. I'll go back to before we... Before we go into writing style, I guess, because, I mean, technically all of this is writing style. True. She wrote the book. <laughs> but um, the premise of the novel changed, like, three times without any resolution to the previous premises. That's writing style. Why don't we just start writing style? Okay, let's, let's do it. Okay, go ahead. So, that was my problem. Um, when we first meet Mariko, again, I won't go into too much detail with everything because some of this is spoilery, but she is trying to figure out the black clan is a and why they're involved in the plot to kill her and her family's convoy and like disrupt their future because the whole reason she's being married off to this guy is so that her family can receive status and honor and power and blah 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 um we never really get that kind of answer too much i mean we do and we don't but it's such a it's, it's like an afterthought by the time we yeah. get to the end of the book. And by the time we get to the end of the book, two or three other major plot developments have suddenly taken over the original premise. So you're like, hang on a second. Mm-hmm. Are, am I not reading? Should I not be paying attention to that anymore? You almost forget about it. Yes! I mean, thank God she reminded us 15 times and <sighs> didn't do anything about That's it. That's the thing. It's like, we're not supposed to pay attention to this premise anymore because it's almost like it's over. She doesn't care anymore. But then she keeps saying how much she hates the Black Clan and she's going to kill them and she's going to find revenge. And yet she's falling in love with someone. It's like, what the? Oh! And speaking on that, because it's not resolved, it, the, we don't really get an answer of... I think we do know who tries to kill her, but we don't know why. Right. And I feel like if that's the main plot of your book, that needs to be answered in book oh, one. Yes. Don't make people wait until yeah. the next book. Yeah. Answer that. At least answer the main plot point. And yeah. then have other things that don't get answered and leave on a cliffhanger. Right. I didn't like that. You know, she never fleshes out the Black Clan either. Um, we do know some back history between two of the members, but did they start the clan or was this something that they were inducted to? Uh, how did they rise to power? I think they started it. Uh, That's never really clear. How did they develop a reputation in such a short amount of time? These are young men. Yeah. This is not 40 year olds. And they didn't start right away. Right. They had to start like Ten year olds are going to start a clan right away. Maybe two or three years. Yeah. And... They have this intense reputation of being like the KGB or like, you know, the mafia or something where it's like you, you encounter them and you're not walking away from this. But again, the entire time we're with them, we don't see any evidence of them being this like big bad clan. I didn't. No. If anything, well, that's a spoiler. Um, I won't say that, but 
we don't get any evidence that this is in fact a clan that you should be afraid of or that people actually fear. I mean, people outright pick fights with these people. That's, that's not, you've got a whole group over here who are avoiding them and then this, these people over here are like, it's just a black clan, let's go get our money. And Come you know on. why, and that's, that's another writing style that I go into that, that I it's find It's so inconsistent. Is that Adia, she, and I feel like this is a rookie mistake, she sets up tr overused plot devices as a way to, as a means to an end. Yeah. So the only reason why we're introduced to this group of people that want to fight the clan is so that we can see Okami's power. Yeah. That's the only reason <laughs> That's so why true. she did that. Yes. And then there are characters that she introduces, and the only point of them is to set something else up. Mm -hmm. And it's a spoiler, I won't go into it. Mm -hmm. But she does that. Um, another one is uh, there's a, a geisha. They go to a tea house, and there's a geisha there. Soon as she walked in, I was like, oh, here she goes. She's going to complain about these women, and they're docile, and they're... They're just there to please men. I knew immediately what that was going to be for, and I was right. Mm -hmm. And at the end, it just, there's this preachy, yep. didactic um, part of the book. And it's yep. like, so she really has to figure out a way to include things in the plot to drive the plot, but that aren't so obvious. Sadly, you hit on a good point that I didn't even remember until now, but the way that she writes female characters in this novel was not impressive to me. First of all, Mariko really is the only female in the entire book until the couple chapters that we get to see the Emperor's Wives. And both of them are in, like, overly saturated traditional female roles where, you know, they're fighting against each other. And when she, in, when, when Mariko engages with these geishas and, and the Makos and stuff, she's very hostile towards them and their choices. She doesn't ask them why they decided to become you know she just it's just all judgment mm -hmm. and are we still doing that since yes, 2017 we are. we're still hating other women for their choices like come on i i don't like female characters like that that was my major problem with what was it the traitor's kiss uh, yeah. it was one of the books we read yeah. recently you know let's stop writing characters where females are hostile towards each other and have nothing like this could have, the whole theme of this book is Mariko trying to figure out what kind of a woman she is. You know, she has to impersonate a man to discover that she is intelligent. And then, you know, I, I just, I would have liked her to find her femininity within the context of other women who are strong and helping her. And that just doesn't have, that was a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. Completely I missed. Agree. Um, another thing that bothered me to high hell was the dialogue was all in proverbs and parables. Oh my, I, can we have, like, who talks like that? I don't know. Do they talk like that back in the day in Japan? I mean, Lord of the Rings, but that's a fictional, I mean, it's just not, no, no. I mean, they would have these, I, it, like, conversations out of nowhere about a love. A warrior is never weak. I mean, it's like, no. People are not coming out of their head with, like, these perfect phrases. No. Every day, all day. And that's how they spoke. Yeah. The entire... That drove that me did. nuts. <laughs> that did get very tiresome. Uh, let's see. We kind of already touched on writing style a little bit. I'm still... I got more. Okay, go ahead. Friend. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so she uses... Um, she doesn't allow the reader to infer. And this is the type That's of so book true. that separates great writing from okay writing. So she's really writing for a 12-year-old. Yes. It's not for a 17-year-old. And a perfect example is... are the is, adults that read YA? No. Um, a perfect example is... We know... Because Mariko keeps telling us that she wants to be in control of her own life. She doesn't want people to control her life. And at one point, she talks about how she lost her virginity in the way she did it. But um, Renee has to spell it out for us and literally mm -hmm. tell us, I did this because I wanted control of my body. All she had to basically write was, she was talking about virginity and she was like, I am no longer pure or whatever. And that's it. That's all she needed to say. Yeah. I didn't need details. Yeah. She doesn't allow us to infer anything. Mm -hmm. And she needs to trust the reader that they're smart enough to figure that out. Yeah. 
So she was, she began to be just overly descriptive. I mean, I think it was two pages when Mariko first goes into that first shop as a boy. It was like three pages of nothing. Just describing the the, the bench and this over <laughs> here. And I'm like, and this is again what I was her. saying in the beginning. Like, she's she's pointing out all of these details and it's like, are we supposed to be paying attention to these random ass inanimate objects? The warm sake. Oh Why do I need an expose on warm sake? <laughs> I mean, those are like supposed to be I cultural get it. developments. I get it. But it does. It's she's she doesn't do it in a good way because when we're getting that warm sake information, we're also like it's there's a lot of tension happening outside of her drinking. And it's like, okay, stop distracting the reader with this random detail that they don't need because something's about to go down. And that's what she should be focusing on. It was very weird. Yeah. Ew, warm sake. That sounds gross. Um, do you have any more about that? I was gonna... My last dislike is the romance. Oh, I'm not Which I think might okay, be yeah, a spoiler. Actually, I am kind of... Wait a minute. Let me see if I have anything else about... Um, <laughs> um, oh, okay. So I think she... What Adia does, she does grow a little bit. And one of the reasons why I hated The Wrath and the Dawn is that... From the first page, the reader already knows that the Emperor is a good guy. The main character does not. She thinks he's a mass murderer. But the reader knows. So the entire time the main character is, should I kill him? Should I not kill him? And we as the reader knows she shouldn't because he's forced to kill these other women. So she grows a little bit in this book where that as the reader, we know that she's a boy. But... I don't know how to explain it. The other characters eventually find out that she's a girl. Did I say we know she's a boy? We know yeah, she's a girl. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but when the characters find out that she's a girl, it doesn't take the entire book for the, us to sit through and be like, oh, God, she's a girl. Damn it. She's a girl. No, they figure it out within five pages. So I feel, I feel like she's grown a little bit with that, but it's still kind of that got a little old and... Um, I forgot one thing that I liked about the book to say is that I liked it when they called her Lord Lackbeard. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lord Lackbeard. Yeah, I just thought that, that was, was hilarious. I, I was, that. I also was going to say that I liked the scene where she falls off the cliff collecting mushrooms. <laughs> I was like, yes. Cause uh, she fell. Cause she fell. Oh, and I just please. don't like her <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I mean, go ahead. That's that's really it for me in terms of what I can go to without oh, and we, spoilers. We, did, did we get into the telling and not showing? She does a lot of telling and I, not yeah, she, showing. Yeah, this is definitely a t this is a sh this is a tell book. And yeah, there's not really a lot of show. She here. kept constantly telling us that Mariko was odd, but she never really yeah. said why she's odd or mm -hmm. how she's odd. Again, Mary Sue. That. You know this this trope of this character is supposed to be interesting, and it's evident to everyone except the main character. It's like ugh. all she did was ask a lot of questions. But Didn't not she, the right questions. Right, I know. She asks stupid questions. And she's so, like, lost in her own... Do you believe in love? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> love is what you make it, my child. Well, there's also a part where she's having a conversation with um, Okami. And she's she's just being this obnoxious little brat. Like, I'm intelligent. Literally, that's what she's saying. And he's like, prove it. And she's like, What? I'm not kidding you. That was the dialogue. That was that when they were on the horse on yes. the way to the tea house. Like, are you not paying attention? Are you not in your conversation? Isn't that like the the number one fundamental of being a samurai or like a ninja? Like you're always present in exactly what's happening right now. Like you could not have possibly embodied none of this any more than she did in this book. I mean, it, it was. I, I almost want to. <laughs> drop my rating another star oh no i went from a three stars to a two stars because the romance at first i was like oh that's different she's not going for who i thought she was going to go for this could be an interesting turn. i didn't even catch that to be honest well you know again you assume true, that the main character is going to go for like the main other guy yeah. and when they don't you're like okay this this can work this could be interesting show me something different but and I won't say what happens because it's a spoiler. <laughs> I'm, say, I'm watching your face. Like, no, 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 I was, I was okay. trying to think of a way to say that, but. Okay. Uh, 
All right, All right so, so, yeah. I think I initially gave it a three and a half, but because I was actually okay. 80% of the book, I was okay. And then it kind of poo-pooed out. And so I think I'm going to drop it to a three. And you're rating the Well, least. like I said, I gave it a three. And then as I sat down to write my notes and really think about why I did or did not like this book, I had to drop it down a star. Because three for me on Goodreads is like, I enjoyed it, I won't read it again, but I didn't hate it. Three is middle of the road. Two is I have problems with this book. And I have serious problems with this book. So okay. it's, a, it's yeah. a two for me. Three for me is I have serious problems. Two is this book is disgusting. And I'll never, I just want to throw it across the room. So it wasn't quite disgusting. Yeah, that's a one star for me. So, yeah. All right. Well, if you are ending the podcast, the next book we will be reviewing is Song of the Current. I don't know who it's by. Sarah Tulser. All right. It's a debut. debut. Yeah, she's a 2017 YA debut. And if you are staying with us for the spoilers, we are starting the spoiler edition in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Whoa. Let's go back to the romance. Okay. Um, there are two, two male characters, Okami, who's kind of like second in command of this black clan, and then there's Ren Maru, and he is the leader of the black clan. He's the one calling the shots. He's in charge. I expected her to um, kind of fall in love with him because of the scene that we see in the first part of the book. I don't know what the hell I was thinking, but I thought Ren Maru was like 40. I kind of did too. I didn't realize. I thought that the big guy that came in was the the kid in the first chapter in the prologue. I was, I was lost. What? I was lost. Oh no. Okay. No, I knew that the, um. But she said he was young. I knew that the guy in the kid in the beginning of the story that who is watching his father basically perform traditional sep- seppuku, I think is how you pronounce Girl, it. You know, you're asking the wrong where person. like you fall on your sword and you commit your own honorable death. Um, and Mariko was there to witness this happen, um, and they kind of have a connection when they're that young, and. Then we meet them when they're older, because she's now with the Black Clan, and you're like, oh, it's that that kid. Um, so I expected that. And then when she ends up falling for Okami, I was intrigued. I was like, let's, that's cool. All right, maybe this can get bumped up a star again. You know, like, <laughs> um, not that I read for stars, but just it's something that I think about. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Okami ends up actually being the real Ranmaru, and Ranmaru is actually the real Okami, and there was this huge identity flip, and I was like, oh, And I don't God. understand why he was... I don't know why that was intrinsic to the plot. I'm not sure why they needed to switch identities, because it just... I just don't know. I don't know. And at one point um, in the book, when Okami finds out that Mariko is really a girl. He goes, "Oh my goodness, I can't tell Ramaru because he's going to be." Oh, okay. I think I solved my own question because at the end we find this mist, and she's like, "Oh my god, it's Ramaru. We knew it was me the whole time." So I don't know if how does she knew it was Ren. She didn't at the point at that point. She didn't know that Okami was really Ramaru. No. So was she seeing a face? I don't know. That whole thing she's like, was "Oh my god, that's Ramaru. He knew I was a girl the whole time." But at that moment it was okami but i don't know how she knew it was him i don't, I don't know. know i completely missed that because I, I expected there to be fallout between okami and ranmaru when she came out that she was a girl just because ranmaru never really seemed to warm up to her like obviously okami had also speaking of fallout between the two of them why did Adia bother to pull in that geisha chick who is in love with one of them, or they're in love with her, but it's actually his sibling? What? what do you remember? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I. What was the point of that? I think that's just a setup for book two. I because she was just trying to create tension between the two and probably try to create jealousy for oh um, Mariko, and then end up being his sister. And he's like, I'm not in love with her. That's my sister. Yeah, that, again, you, like, you think that all of these things are going to come around in the first... You have to resolve the plot in your first book. Like, yes, you have a series. You know, there's a larger mm-hmm. plot here, but... So, yeah, that really confused me. I don't know. Um, any other comments about the romance? 
I, I, yeah, I got a big comment. She, her brother is risking everything to yeah, find her. We haven't her. talked about him at all. No. I don't know his name. Kirsten Kenshin. Now. Kenshin. He is risking his life and limb to help her and not help her find her. And then she says, screw you, dude. I'm going to go bang this Okami guy over here. I'm not even going to like, and I didn't get that at all. Yeah. And several times throughout the book, she intentionally foils her brother from saving her. I mean, I know like, why she did that. Cause she's trying to figure out why they try to kill her quote well, unquote. And she secretly likes being there. I know. She but likes being there cause she's free. The whole reason that she decided to not go back to her family in the first place is because she's trying to salvage their honor by salvaging her oh, own it's honor. It's like, how does staying away from your family more days accomplish that? She's kind of says she's freaking dumb. She says I shouldn't be I, the longer I stay away, whatever, but that doesn't uh, help yeah. matters. So um, don't say that if if that is not what you're going to do. Like, and, and at no point does she, like, take her brother aside and be like, hey, this is what's going down, just so you know. But every time he gets hurt or in the in the midst of being hurt, she's like, oh, my God. It's like, you're yeah. at fault for this whole bag. So when Yumi, which is <laughs> Okami's sister, is like, oh, by the way, your brother is on the way to kill everybody. Instead of going to her brother and she saying. She makes a bomb. I'm like. <laughs> instead of going to her brother and saying, oh, by the way, they're, yeah. going, to, they're going to steal all of yeah. your food. And they're going to try and kill you because you killed Cook. Um, no, she goes to them in her, in her outfit, because I'm a girl now, and I'm here to help you. And she's with them for, like, three days, and no time does she go and try and contact no, her brother. That made absolutely no sense. You know, and I, I don't find it plausible when a main character just suddenly abandons their family Especially like that. Especially when it's your twin. Right. Like, even... In real life, we know how compelling family influence is. Even if you have a difficult family relationship, you're still, you want to, you want to do, you want to make them proud. I mean, I just didn't understand her sudden abandonment of her family. No it's like reason. she learns that her dad isn't this perfect person that she thought he was. A shocker, really, that never occurred to you again major problem with the main character who apparently sees little details but missed that her family isn't this perfect family and now she like wants nothing to have to do with them I didn't get that especially when she knows that her brother is fighting for her right and she just like yeah I'm gonna go bang this dude over here screw you I'm like no that was the turn for me when she did that I mean it was already at yeah. a, a fine line but then that is when it took the biggest turn she kind of seemed just unstable. I don't know. It was not a good character. No. <laughs> Anywho. Um, so I was saying this in the spoiler free edition about how Renee, she, she sets up scenes for a reason. It's a means to an end. It's not really part of the story. And, um, one of the things she does <clears throat> is, uh, Mariko really likes Cook. He's in the Black Clan and he is the cook. And he is the for only person at first who really takes her under his wing and like helps her. And of course he dies. So we're only he's only there for sympathy. And then um Amaya, who is in love with Keenan, what's his name? Kenshin. Kenshin. Um, she's only there to cause a divide between <laughs> Kenshin, <laughs> Kenshin Keenan and Amaya <laughs> between <laughs> those two characters so that he doesn't like his dad anymore. I know. That's the only, I know. It's, and the dad was such again, the worst villain ever. Man, she's fine. Just let her stay in there in the know, barn. Again, it's like, if you're going to sever a child from their parents, you need to do it in a way that is much more compelling and plausible than a love interest. And that's, and that's what Kanako... That's what got me. The, the Empress Consort, that's what she has over his head, too. Oh, mm -hmm. I know I have his girlfriend that he loves and she loves and they don't profess their love. And I'm going to use that if against they, him. It would have made much more sense to me if they were using the twins against each yeah. other. 
Because that's family. That's, yeah. again, that's blood. It's way more compelling and plausible. It's just writing style, man. <laughs> um, let's talk about, since you brought up the, the fact that she kind of brings things up and then doesn't resolve them. In the beginning of the book, when she makes it away from the caravan that's on fire, you know, so she's escaped this, like, attack, first of all. And she's escaped this um, fire. Or, sorry, the clan. Both of which I was kind of like, mm, she's getting away a little too easy. <laughs> this, again, notorious clan doesn't know the face of the person that they're trying to find. And then they just leave without making sure that everyone's, in fact, dead. Well, the night Please. beast came. Right, so the night beast came. She doesn't explain who that is or what that is. Um, it's this big thing that, like, is supposed to attack everyone that even steps foot in the forest at a certain time. But her, it doesn't. You know what? Was that Okami? It, no. Or Renmaro or whatever? No, it was, I think it was Kanako. Oh, you know we what? Because we were at the end. Been. However, if Norigato, what's his name? No Butubi. Oh my god. <laughs> no Tubi. No. <laughs> no Butada. No Butada. If No Butada was the real killer, doesn't he know that Kanako is the night bringer? The night beast? He might. So why would he get scared off by the night beast? I don't know. I, Come on. I don't know. Maybe she hid her power from him. Again, it's it's all confusing, convoluted, and, and unexplained. That's the only reason why they didn't go back to check. Because well, the night beast came. And the, 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 the writer makes it sound like this beast is on her side. Like, it looks at her. It like she's, She even says, it seems to be warning me. And then, sure enough, right after she encounters it, she encounters this rapey guy who tries to kill her. So doesn't Kanako what? want her dead? Yeah. So why did she come and, t and scare away no Batu? But this is the thing. We don't know that, in fact, this is Kanako. I did not get She's that She's the only until you one that. that can bring the Night Beast. She's the only one, because she kept, like, she has this weird spider that does things and some kind yeah, of fox, and she's the probable. only one that has magic besides Okami that we know of. Yeah. So I it has to I be don't her. Know. I do not know. That makes no so sense. So why, why didn't she? Why did she warn her as the night beast and come appear as the night yeah, beast? Yeah. Why would no she hire this Nobutada guy to betray his his the family he serves, kill all these other people when she could just be this person and kill what's her face, Mariko? Yeah, that makes no sense. So the book is ten pages long. Oh my god! <laughs> wow. Okay. I mean, if anyone else has read this book and, like, we got this bit wrong, please yeah, comment on the video wrong, or tweet us. Because that's a huge plot hole. Yeah. That just occurred to us. Um, so, we'd love to hear from you if you yeah. have any info on that that we missed. Do you have anything else? Um, I, I don't have anything else. I'm, I feel like I've said Just I piece. didn't understand the whole... I don't understand... Kanako's motive, or Jen May, which is the Emperor's wife. I agree. I don't understand. They both love their kids, and they're both in it for their kid. But, so you theorized that Jen May wants her son to be the Shogun? No, um, she wants her son to maintain the power that he has. But I wasn't sure if Kanako wanted her son to be the Shogun, or if she wanted him to be actual Emperor. I wasn't, because there's a theme in this book where um, a lot of the conflict that is happening socially and politically is because the current Emperor has gotten rid of this kind of second power of the Shogun that's supposed to keep him accountable and also act as his force. Um, so he's just ruling by himself and it's causing problems and that kind of thing. So there's people in the story who want their son to be this second person that's supposed to be in power. Um, and we're not sure. That was never really clear. Well, I think it does have something to do with that because Raiden presents Okami with the sword. He's like, this is your sword. Don't you want your sword? And that sword meant something because mm -hmm. it belonged to his father, who was the original Shogun. Mm -hmm. So it... it Maybe the Shogun has more power than the Emperor does, and he's just a figurehead and has no real power. And that's what yeah, the, for. yeah. I don't know the what their Emperor motives are. They killed. They killed the Emperor. I don't know why. Yeah. Never really says why. It's everything's really confusing. The the Emperor needed to go so that Reiko. I don't remember the other brother's name, 
so that he could officially become emperor, and then maybe so that Raiden can also come up and be the shogun beside him, but it's unclear if the two women are working together or if they're actual enemies, because all throughout the book they've been mortal enemies. So, again, it's just like everything that's being set up for book two is not clear. I, I would not be able to go into, into book two knowing what to expect in terms of plot. I won't be reading book two, but you need to leave your reader with a sense of, this is what I read, this is an accomplishment of what happened in this book. I didn't get that. No. I got frustration. Yeah. So. So. Yeah, if, so if we're like way off our rocker, let us know. We'd love to know if you like this book or if you agree us agree with us. Um, let us know. But otherwise, we will be podcasting next week about Song of the Current, which is also a fantasy, but a very different vein of fantasy. So join us next time. All right. We'll catch you in the next podcast.